Um, my name is Ian Matthews, and today I'm going to talk to you about Rediviz. At the highest level, our goal and vision in Rediviz is to imagine a world where policy and scientifically relevant data are readily available, interpretable to a wide range of individuals. We really want to work to break down barriers in data-driven research and do this in a way that really promotes and facilitates collaboration as well as communication of the data sciences. Um, data are not always the sexiest sub subject. They are not always the most um, palatable to a broader audience, but they are incredibly policy relevant. They are incredibly relevant to how we structure our society, how we, how we make decisions, um, and really thinking about how we can develop tools that make data more relevant. Um, and finally, we really want to work to reduce the fundamental tension that we think exists between data availability and security. Um, data need to be kept, or certain data need to be kept restricted. We cannot um, get around this, but we can really think about what tools can we implement and develop to narrow this gap and to make, um, to make those who should be able to access these data um, able to quickly and efficiently. As Smalley mentioned, we started out about 18 months ago in a close partnership with the Stanford Center for Population and Health Sciences. And their mission is to provide a central hub of data assets to facilitate transdisciplinary population health projects and collaborations across the university. Today, um, PHS is using Rediviz to manage access for over 120 active users across 93 source data sets, um, across 215 projects that in total contain over 726 billion records. Um, we've been developing this over 18 months. It really went live only a few months ago and these metrics um, reflect what's happened just in the past few months. So what is Rediviz? Rediviz is a cloud-based data platform that provides in-browser tools for administrators to host and manage data and uh, couples these to resources for researchers to discover and query data sets. It's a scalable, structured data repository um, wed to visual high-performance querying tools that are all wrapped within an administrative interface. When we set out to work with PHS, we basically didn't write any code for three months. Um, and we just spent our time interviewing scores of researchers to really identify the, their pain points um, and, and friction in working with data, specifically in the medical sciences. And time and again, we identified two primary challenges. The first, as I mentioned, was around access control and administration. Um, and we really set out to streamline user experience to reduce the, the duplication in, the, in um, researchers' processes in gaining access to data and really make sure we were eliminating security theater. Things shouldn't be hard to access just because um, we want to make it seem like they're hard to access. Um, they should be secure. Um, but we need to do this in a way that grants administrators the ability to fully enforce the data usage restrictions that exist in their DUAs um, and audit user, user behavior and make sure they're um, acting appropriately. The second primary challenge um, was in considering the user experience and working with big data technologies. Um, the minds in this room are very competent at working with these technologies. This is not necessarily true for the population of uh, medical researchers. And we really wanted to remove the technical barriers um, for no novice researchers and think about ways that we can um, bring these technologies closer to them. We wanted to decouple the necessity of having an understanding of computer science um, in working with data in the medical sciences. So to talk about this first um, challenge around um, access and permissioning, I didn't start off realizing this, but I've come to realize that you cannot democratize, um, you cannot democratize data without addressing access. At a fundamental level, um, access to a data set involves a user who has an identity who wants to perform an action on a data set. When we came in, this action step was a binary. Um, a user either had full access to a data set or they couldn't see anything at all. And so we heard all these stories of researchers who were fishing in the dark, um, applying for access to data sets when they didn't even know the variable names. They didn't know what content the data contained. Um, and we really wanted to think about how can we provide as much information upfront for researchers so they can assess data utility before they go through all of these steps to gain full access to a data set. Um, and so one of our first innovations was really to break out this action step into um, compartmentalized um, security levels that then administrators could apply permissioning onto. So in Rediviz, there are three different actions a user can perform on a data set. They can list the data set so they can view its existence and see some over overview information. They can preview the data, so this means look at its variables and summary statistics, and then they can gain full access to the data. 
And on any of these given actions, an administrator can specify a rule or series of rules for researchers to gain that level of access, ideally providing as much information up front while maintaining the underlying security of the data. Administrators do this by applying three different access paradigms um, that they can mix and match on any of these access levels, or actions, rather. Um, the first is probably the most simple, the one of direct approval. I want to give this particular user the ability to view the um, summary statistics of the variables on this data set. Um, and this needs to be pr approved potentially for any combination of users and data sets and actions. The second one is of uh, requirements. Um, the real world corollary here would be that a researcher needs to have completed their HIPAA training in order to look at this particular data set. Um, and so the requirement can apply to any action um, and the, the researcher would fill out that requirement once and then it applies to all data sets that exist across an organization. Um, so we have a clear audible paper trail that they have done their requirements, um, and, but the researcher just fills it out once and they're done. Um, and finally, we've implemented the concept of a study. Uh, the real world um, corollary here is an IRB where we combine multiple researchers alongside multiple data sets into, uh, that are kind of grouped together around a common research question into one authorized workspace um, in which they're working with these data um, around that question. So um, all three of these um, paradigms can be applied by administrators on any one of those actions. Um, they don't have to use all of them, but this allows for them to basically decompose the legal restrictions that they have in data use agreements um, into the user interface by which users gain access to data. The um, second component here is around user experience, and I'm really just going to lead into a, a demo here to show you what this is, this is like. Um, but the four key points that we were thinking about when we developed our user interfaces um, were that we really wanted to build a system that promoted discovery and exploration of data in a way that facilitated users' understanding of new data sets. Too often, researchers just worked with data sets that they already knew because getting up to speed with new data was so challenging. We really want to reduce the barrier to entry in working with large data sets, do this all in a way that aids in documentation and reproducibility. So with that, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to be doing mostly a demo here. Um, we're going to do a fairly simple example because we only have a few minutes, but we're going to look, um, we're going to generate a cohort of individuals um, who may be candidates for postpartum depression, looking at insurance claims data um, for private um, insurers in the United States. It's going to be a live demo, so we're going to pray to the live demo gods that everything works here. All right, um, so this is the Stanford Center for Population Health Sciences homepage on Rediviz. Any of you can go here right now, rediviz.com slash Stanford PHS. Um, and here a researcher can see an overview of the organization, the data sets that it is hosting, um, and additional metadata that we see at left. We want to generate a cohort of individuals who may have postpartum depression. Um, so to do that, we need to identify individuals who gave birth, who had a delivery. Um, this is an inpatient event. It happens at a hospital. And we're going to combine those with individuals who were diagnosed with depression. Um, very often, that diagnosis will be an outpatient event. So to start, we can look at the data sets that are available on the PHS homepage, and let's search for inpatient um, data sets. Close enough. Um, and we see several data sets here um, that have inpatient data. Specifically for today's example, we're going to be looking at the Optum inpatient um, data set. I think this has um, data on about 20 million individuals in the United States over about a decade. When the researcher arrives here, they see an overview of the data set. If I have list access permissions to the data, I can then see that this data set exists and I can see this page. Um, there's some metadata that is pre-populated by Rediviz as well as additional information and characteristics that administrators can provide about the data set. A researcher can see all of the steps necessary to gain different levels of access to this data set. So as we see here, there are these three tiers of action, uh, three actions that um, a user can perform on the data set. Uh, administrators of PHS have opted to make the viewing of the, the existence of this data set public, the ability to preview it, um, uh, contingent on fulfilling the requirement that you have an affiliation with Stanford, a fairly low barrier for most researchers um, with PHS. Um, and finally, uh, researchers have to jump through additional steps to get full access to the data. Um, today, I'm going to be working from an account that has full access to this data set. And so when I click on the data tab, I'm first presented with a list of variables. I know that I want to look for um, individuals who had a delivery. This is a procedure event, so I want to see do I have a variable that contains procedure codes? 
I search here, I'm given a list of all of the variables that contain um, procedure codes or are relevant to my search query. Um, and because I have access to also see the summary statistics, I can click on these, see some top level information. We have 17 and a half million records here um, with 0% missingness, 23,000 distinct values. Um, and I can also look at a frequency distribution of those distinct values. If I click here, let's order this. Um, we can see outside of what looks like just kind of a bad value at the top, um, the most common value <laughs> is um, uh, 741 followed by 7359. These are actually both codes um, relevant to delivery. 741 is a cesarean section, 7359 a vaginal birth. Um, and uh, so in, right away up front, a researcher can see um, that this data set contains procedure information variables. They can see the frequency of the occurrence of different codes that they might want to look for in the data. Um, additionally, just from this page, we expose a querying interface for more technical researchers where they can um, interrogate the table, write their own SQL. Um, and so just really quickly, um, so you don't have to watch me fudge SQL here, I have um, a little bit typed out. Um, and this is just going to look at the average length of stay for these two, um, these two procedure codes. Um, I guess that, that was cache because I ran this last night to make sure it works. Um, but usually this would take about two seconds and we'll do some um, additional querying in a second. Um, but we see here that the um, average length of stay is a day and a half longer um, for those who had a cesarean section. Once a researcher has identified this data set as being relevant to their work, they can add it to a project within Rediviz. If I click I add to project button here, um, let's call this optum postpartum example, we've then added this table to the Rediviz project workspace. Here we're looking at the same table that we were before with the same variables. The only difference here is by default, it adds a 1% sample or adds the lowest sample available of the given data set to allow for users to explore freely and not worry, worry about um, running up usage quotas. Um, to highlight the performance characteristics today, I'm going to upgrade this to the full data set. So we're looking at the full 100% sample of the inpatient confinement table. Within this project workspace, there are two fundamental operations that a researcher can perform. They can either create a transform that takes one table in and outputs a table, or create a join that brings multiple tables together. Um, and the idea here is to um, kind of compartmentalize every step of the cohort building process um, and have a clear picture of what one did um, and in a way that really aids in reproducibility when you go back and look at your work six months from now or share it with a colleague. So to start, we want to take from this um, table of inpatient admissions, uh, we want to reduce it to those individuals who had a delivery. So we can add a new transform here. Um, and this exposes a graphical user interface for um, querying the data. Um, our first step is to choose which variables or columns we want to propagate to the next table. Um, so here we would want the unique patient identifier, um, pad ID, um, and let's bring through um, the admission date information um, because when we're looking at postpartum depression, we're going to be looking at the occurrence of depression relative to the admit date. Um, and if we want to, we could bring in, in additional procedure codes and what have you. Um, our only next step here in this particular transform is to reduce the records to those um, that represent individuals who had, um, who had a delivery. So we can say we want all records where PROC1 equals 741 and 7359. And we can go ahead and run this transform. This is telling us it's going to compute on about half a gigabyte here. Um, that should exit in a couple seconds. While it's running, we can add the additional data set here that will contain outpatient information um, about, um, that, that will contain di depression diagnos diagnostic information to generate our final cohort. Um, so here we're going to bring in the Optum medical claims table. Um, and again, upgrade it to the full sample. This is a much larger data set. It has four and a half billion records. Um, and we're going to join it to our um, cohort of individuals who had a delivery. To do that, we create what we call a join. Um, and we specify that we're going to join this to the Optum um, medical claims table. And we're going to join on the pad ID variable. This is our unique identifier for each individual. Um, we can bring on in any number of variables from either table. Um, so maybe let's just bring in some diagnosis information. Um, and finally, we only want to do a join when someone had, um, uh, had, had, was diagnosed with depression. Um, so we can filter all records on this join, keeping only those where 
Diag 1. equals, and I've got a list of codes here in Excel, I can just copy and paste right in, equals any of those codes. Um, I can run this join, this is joining, um, this table here we never looked at the output, this is about a million records, it's joining it on four and a half billion records, um, and if all goes according to plan, it should exit in about 10 seconds, there we go. Um, and we see that we have our final table of half a million records, um, I'll note that these are not all the codes relevant to deliveries. This is kind of a, a fairly trivial example um, but to give you a sense of how a researcher could go in here um, and generate a cohort of individuals who are specifically relevant to the research question they want to ask. From here, a user can export this table. Um, with PHS, they are able, able to restrict where a user can export the table um, to prevent any data leakage. Um, this goes to a secure compute environment at Stanford, um, but there's no reason for less restricted data. The user couldn't just download their output table um, and then apply um, any number of statistical packages onto that um, output table um, to further analyze their results. Okay, um, just as we wrap up here, um, for those that are curious, this is all um, deployed on Google Cloud Platform. Um, we leverage Kubernetes for our application architecture. Um, it's great, I highly recommend it. Um, and our primary data store is BigQuery. Um, and that was what was running behind the scenes on all of these, um, all, all those queries. Um, I, we've been incredibly happy with BigQuery. It is blazingly fast, um, especially when your results set is fairly small. If it has to write um, uh, several billion records, it's going to take 10 minutes. But if it has to, if it has to write 500,000, it'll exit in a few seconds, even on um, truly massive queries, uh, queries on the source data sets. So this is where we are. This is where we've come in about 18 months. Um, but we're really excited about where we're going. Um, this coming month, we're going to be releasing an improved querying interface. What you just saw was kind of our first pass of thinking about how can we build a cohort building tool that's accessible to a wide array of researchers. Um, and we're really going to be working to um, provide better training and documentation for users who are getting familiar with it, while also supporting greater complexity in their queries and, and supporting basically the entirety of SQL through that um, GUI. Um, all while exposing a full SQL interface for more advanced users who really don't want to point and click within a GUI. This summer, we're excited to start thinking about how we can integrate this with additional analytical tools. Right now, Rediviz is a discovery and exploration engine coupled to a cohort building tool. It is not for analysis. You export your, your cohort um, to perform further analysis on it. Um, but I think there's a lot that we can think about of, in terms of which open source technologies we can plug in here. We're looking at um, Jupyter Labs very closely. I'm um, thinking about how we can tie it into our ecosystem. Um, and finally, um, this fall, we're going to start thinking a lot more about how we can leverage this platform and this foundation um, to facilitate better collaboration and, and crowdsource curation of data sets. We really want to build a community here who are sharing their knowledge around all of these data. Um, and we really look to, to models such as GitHub to think about how can the crowd um, apply their knowledge to the data sets. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, with regards to the user authorization and the roles, did you use the Google Identity Management Service or did you roll your own? We, we rolled our own kind of at the application layer. Um, and I'll mention, I didn't get too much into that in the demo and showing what the administrative interface looks like. That's been our life for the past six months. We'd love to show anybody a demo if they're curious about that side of things later today. Hi, I was wondering if you uh, track the session information, you keep the provenance, like could you go back and replay things you did or could you at least uh, take the things you did and convert it to, into some kind of a description so you know what, what was done to get that data set? Right, right, so, the, so this project tool, um, the idea there is that kind of every single step of your, of your work is, um, is defined. So and this, this is saved to my user workspace. So at any point, I can come back here, I can see all of my ongoing projects, um, I can share this with other people, and I can hop back into it um, and see each transform that, that kind of was applied to the source data sets and then downstream to ultimately produce my output table. Um, I can also export the code that was run against those tables, um, and I can assign additional metadata. I can give each of these nodes names um, and provide 
um, notation as well as to what was going on there. Um, and I'll mention really quickly also that um, we do support data versioning. So kind of through this tool, when administrators upload data, um, they can then transform the data sets and do their own ETL process. And any user, when they bring a data set into the project, it'll start with the highest version available, but they can look at the entire version history, um, use a different version, um, or upgrade it to a new version when it's released. Thank you, Yoon. And uh, prior to picking BigQuery, did you also look at like AWS Redshift or Athena and then chose BigQuery for a, a particular reason? Um, we did. A part of that was Stanford's very strong relationship with um, Google. Um, but I also think it, it was the right choice in, in hearing um, the, the cost modeling of BigQuery works really well here for what we're trying to do. Um, it's no ops design has allowed us to roll this out really quickly. Um, and yeah, I guess those, those two. We've been very happy with it. Thank you. Thank you.